Spirituality is a particular term which actually means a dealing with intuition. In the theistic tradition, there is notion of clinging into a word. A certain act is regarded as uh, displeasing to a divine principles. A certain act is regarded as pleasing for the divine whatever. In the tradition of non-theism, however, it is very direct that the case history are not particularly important. What is actually important is here and now. Here and now. Now is definitely now. We try to experience what is available there on the spot. There's no point in thinking that the past did exist that we could have now. This is now. This very moment. This very moment. Nothing mystical, just now, very simple, straightforward. And from that nowness, however, arises a sense of intelligence, always, that you are constantly interacting with the reality one by one, spot by spot, constantly. We actually experience fantastic precision, always. But we are threatened by the now, so we jump to the past or the future. Paying attention to the materials that exist in our life, such rich life that we lead. All these choices take place all the time, but none of them are regarded as bad or good per se. Everything we experience are unconditional experience. They don't come along with the label by saying this is regarded as bad, this is good. But we experience them, but we don't actually pay heed to them properly. We don't actually regard that as a, that we are going somewhere. We regard that as a hassle, waiting to be dead. Waiting to be dead. Waiting to be dead. Waiting to be dead. That's the problem. And that is not trusting the nowness properly, that what is actually experienced now possessed a lot of powerful things. It is so powerful that we can't face it. Therefore, we have to borrow from the past, invite future all the time. And maybe that's why we seek religion. Maybe that's why we march in, the street. march in the street. Maybe that's why we complain to the society. To the society. Maybe that's why we vote for the presidents. It's quite ironical. Very funny indeed.
the more you begin to investigate what we think we understand, where we came from, what we think we're doing, the more you begin to see we've been lied to. We've been lied to by every institution. What makes you think for one minute that the religious institution is the only one that's never been touched? The religious institutions of this world are at the bottom of the dirt. The religious institutions in this world are put there by the same people who gave you your government, your corrupt education, who set up your international banking cartels, because our masters don't give a damn about you or your family. All they care about is what they have always cared about, and that's controlling the whole damn world. We have been misled away from the true and divine presence in the universe that men have called God. I don't know what God is, but I know what he isn't. And unless and until you are prepared to look at the whole truth, and wherever it may go, whoever it may lead to, if you want to look the other way, or if you want to play favorites, then somewhere along the line you're going to find out you're messing with divine justice. The more you educate yourself, the more you understand where things come from, the more obvious things become and you begin to see lies everywhere. You have to know the truth and seek the truth and the truth will set you free. Because I got to tell you the truth, folks. I got to tell you the truth. When it comes to bullshit, big time, major league bullshit, you have to stand in awe of the all-time champion of false promises and exaggerated claims, religion. Think about it. Religion has actually convinced people that there's an invisible man living in the sky who watches everything you do every minute of every day and the invisible man has a special list of 10 things he does not want you to do and if you do any of these 10 things he has a special place full of fire and smoke and burning and torture and anguish where he will send you to live and suffer and burn and choke and scream and cry forever and ever till the end of time but he loves you. <laughs> he loves you. He loves you and he needs money. He always needs money. He's all powerful, all perfect, all knowing and all wise. Somehow, just can't handle money. Religion takes in billions of dollars, they pay no taxes, and they always need a little more. Now, you talk about a good bullshit story. Holy shit. is the sun. As far back as 10,000 BC, 
History is abundant with carvings and writings reflecting people's respect and adoration for this object. And it is simple to understand why, as every morning the sun would rise, bringing vision, warmth, and security, saving man from the cold, blind, predator-filled darkness of night. Without it, the cultures understood, the crops would not grow, and life on the planet would not survive. These realities made the sun the most adored object of all time. Likewise, they were also very aware of the stars. The tracking of the stars allowed them to recognize and anticipate events which occurred over long periods of time, such as eclipses and full moons. They in turn cataloged celestial groups into what we know today as constellations. This is the Cross of the Zodiac, one of the oldest conceptual images in human history. It reflects the Sun as it figuratively passes through the 12 major constellations over the course of a year. It also reflects the 12 months of the year, the four seasons, and the solstices and equinoxes. The term Zodiac relates to the fact that constellations were anthropomorphized, or personified, as figures or animals. In other words, the early civilizations did not just follow the sun and stars, they personified them with elaborate myths involving their movements and relationships. The sun, with its life-giving and saving qualities, was personified as a representative of the unseen creator or god, God's sun, the light of the world, the savior of humankind. Likewise, the twelve constellations represented places of travel for God's sun and were identified by names, usually representing elements of nature that happened during that period of time. For example, Aquarius, the water bearer, who brings the spring rains. This is Horus. He is the sun god of Egypt of around 3000 BC. He is the sun, anthropomorphized, and his life is a series of allegorical myths involving the sun's movement in the sky. From the ancient hieroglyphics in Egypt, we know much about the solar messiah. For instance, Horus, being the sun or the light, had an enemy known as Set, and Set was the personification of the darkness or night. And, metaphorically speaking, every morning Horus would win the battle against Set, while in the evening Set would conquer Horus and send him into the underworld. It is important to note that dark versus light, or good versus evil, is one of the most ubiquitous mythological dualities ever known, and is still expressed on many levels to this day. Broadly speaking, the story of Horus is as follows. Horus was born on December 25th of the virgin Isis, Mary. His birth was accompanied by a star in the east, and upon his birth he was adored by three kings. At the age of 12, he was a prodigal child teacher, and at the age of 30, he was baptized by a figure known as Anup, and thus began his ministry. Horus had 12 disciples he traveled about with, performing miracles such as healing the sick and walking on water. Horus was known by many gestural names such as the Truth, the Light, God's Anointed Son, the Good Shepherd, the Lamb of God, and many others. After being betrayed by Typhon, Horus was crucified, buried for three days, and thus resurrected. These attributes of Horus, whether original or not, seem to permeate many cultures of the world, for many other gods are found to have the same general mythological structure. Attis of Phrygia, born of the Virgin Nana on December 25th, crucified, placed in a tomb, and after three days was resurrected. Krishna of India, born of the Virgin Devaki, with a star in the east signaling his coming. He performed miracles with his disciples, and upon his death was resurrected. Dionysus of Greece, born of a virgin on December 25th, was a traveling teacher who performed miracles such as turning water into wine. He was referred to as the King of Kings, God's only begotten Son, the Alpha and Omega, and many others. And, upon his death, he was resurrected. Mithra of Persia, born of a virgin on December 25th, he had twelve disciples and performed miracles, and upon his death was buried for three days and thus resurrected. He was also referred to as the Truth, the Light, and many others. Interestingly, the sacred day of worship of Mithra was Sunday. The fact of the matter is, there are numerous saviors from different periods from all over the world which subscribe to these general characteristics. The question remains, why these attributes? Why the virgin birth on December 25th? 
Why dead for three days in the inevitable resurrection? Why twelve disciples or followers? To find out, let's examine the most recent of the solar messiahs. Jesus Christ was born of the Virgin Mary on December 25th in Bethlehem. His birth was announced by a star in the east, which three kings or magi followed to locate and adorn the new savior. He was a child teacher at 12, and at the age of 30 he was baptized by John the Baptist, and thus began his ministry. Jesus had 12 disciples, which he traveled about with, performing miracles such as healing the sick, walking on water, raising the dead. He was also known as the King of Kings, the Son of God, the Light of the World, the Alpha and Omega, the Lamb of God, and many, many others. After being betrayed by his disciple Judas and sold for 30 pieces of silver, he was crucified, placed in a tomb, and after three days was resurrected and ascended into heaven. First of all, the birth sequence is completely astrological. The star in the east is Sirius, the brightest star in the night sky, which, on December 24th, aligns with the three brightest stars in Orion's belt. These three bright stars in Orion's belt are called today what they were called in ancient times, the Three Kings. And the Three Kings and the brightest star, Sirius, all point to the place of the sunrise on December 25th. This is why the Three Kings follow the star in the east, in order to locate the sunrise the birth of the sun. The Virgin Mary is the constellation Virgo, also known as Virgo the Virgin. Virgo in Latin means virgin. Virgo was also referred to as the house of bread, and the representation of Virgo is a virgin holding a sheaf of wheat. This house of bread and its symbol of wheat represents August and September, the time of harvest. In turn, Bethlehem, in fact, literally translates to House of Bread. Bethlehem is thus a reference to the constellation Virgo, a place in the sky, not on Earth. There is another very interesting phenomenon that occurs around December 25th, or the winter solstice. From the summer solstice to the winter solstice, the days become shorter and colder. And from the perspective of the northern hemisphere, the sun appears to move south and get smaller and more scarce. The shortening of the days and the expiration of the crops when approaching the winter solstice symbolized the process of death to the ancients. It was the death of the sun. And by December 22nd, the sun's demise was fully realized. For the sun, having moved south continually for six months, makes it to its lowest point in the sky. Here a curious thing occurs. The sun stops moving south, at least perceivably, for three days. And during this three-day pause, the sun resides in the vicinity of the Southern Cross, or Crux, constellation. And after this time, on December 25th, the sun moves one degree, this time north, foreshadowing longer days, warmth, and spring. And thus it was said, the sun died on the cross, was dead for three days, only to be resurrected or born again. This is why Jesus and numerous other sun gods share the crucifixion, three-day death and resurrection concept. It is the sun's transition period before it shifts its direction back into the northern hemisphere, bringing spring and thus salvation. However, they did not celebrate the resurrection of the sun until the spring equinox, or Easter. This is because at the spring equinox, the sun officially overpowers the evil darkness, as daytime thereafter becomes longer in duration than the night, and the revitalizing conditions of spring emerge. Now, probably the most obvious of all the astrological symbolism around Jesus regards the twelve disciples. They are simply the twelve constellations of the zodiac, which Jesus, being the sun, travels about with. In fact, the number twelve is replete throughout the Bible. Coming back to the cross of the zodiac, the figurative life of the sun, this was not just an artistic expression or tool to track the sun's movement. It was also a pagan spiritual symbol, the shorthand of which looked like this. This is not a symbol of Christianity. It is a pagan adaptation of the cross of the zodiac.
This is why Jesus in early occult art is always shown with his head on the cross. For Jesus is the Son, the Son of God, the light of the world, the risen Savior who will come again, as it does every morning, the glory of God who defends against the works of darkness as he is born again every morning and can be seen coming in the clouds up in heaven with his crown of thorns or sun rays. Now, of the many astrological, astronomical metaphors in the Bible, one of the most important has to do with the ages. Throughout the scriptures there are numerous references to the age. In order to understand this, we need to be familiar with a phenomenon known as the precession of the equinoxes. The ancient Egyptians, along with cultures long before them, recognized that approximately every 2150 years, the sunrise on the morning of the spring equinox would occur in a different sign of the zodiac. This has to do with a slow, angular wobble that the Earth maintains as it rotates on its axis. It is called a precession because the constellations go backwards rather than through the normal yearly cycle. The amount of time it takes for the precession to go through all 12 signs is roughly 25,765 years. This is also called the Great Year. And ancient societies were very aware of this, and they referred to each 2150 year period as an age. From 4300 BC to 2150 BC, it was the age of Taurus, the bull. From 2150 BC to 1 AD, it was the age of Aries, the ram. And from 1 AD to 2150 AD, it is the age of Pisces, the age we are still in to this day. And in and around 2150, we will enter the new age, the age of Aquarius. Now, the Bible reflects, broadly speaking, a symbolic movement through three ages while foreshadowing a fourth. In the Old Testament, when Moses comes down Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments, he is very upset to see his people worshipping a golden bull calf. In fact, he shattered the stone tablets and instructed his people to kill each other in order to purify themselves. Most biblical scholars will attribute this anger to the fact that the Israelites were worshipping a false idol or something to that effect. The reality is, the golden bull is Taurus the bull, and Moses represents the new age of Ares the ram. This is why Jews even today still blow the ram's horn. Moses represents the new age of Ares, and upon the new age, everyone must shed the old age. Other deities mark these transitions as well, such as Mithra, a pre-Christian god who kills the bull in the same symbology. Now Jesus is the figure who ushers in the age following Ares, the age of Pisces, or the two fish. Fish symbolism is very abundant in the New Testament. Jesus feeds 5,000 people with bread and two fish. When he begins his ministry walking along Galilee, he befriends two fishermen who follow him. And I think we have all seen the Jesus fish on the back of people's cars. Little do they know what it actually means. It is a pagan astrological symbolism for the sun's kingdom during the age of Pisces. Also, Jesus' assumed birth date is essentially the start of this age. At Luke 22.10, when Jesus is asked by his disciples where the last Passover would be, Jesus replies, Behold, when ye are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you, bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entereth in. This scripture is by far one of the most revealing of all the astrological references. The man bearing the pitcher of water is Aquarius, the water bearer, who is always pictured as a man pouring out a pitcher of water. He represents the age after Pisces, and when the Son, God's Son, leaves the age of Pisces, Jesus, it will go into the house of Aquarius, as Aquarius follows Pisces in the procession of the equinoxes. All Jesus is saying is that after the age of Pisces will come the age of Aquarius. Now, we have all heard about the end times and the end of the world. The cartoonish depictions in the book of Revelation aside, 
The main source of this idea comes from Matthew 28.20, where Jesus says, I will be with you even to the end of the world. However, in the King James Version, world is a mistranslation, among many mistranslations. The actual word being used is eon, which means age. I will be with you even to the end of the age, which is true, as Jesus' solar Piscean personification will end when the sun enters the age of Aquarius. The entire concept of end times and the end of the world is a misinterpreted astrological allegory. Let's tell that to the approximately 100 million people in America who believe the end of the world is coming. Furthermore, the character of Jesus being a literary and astrological hybrid is most explicitly a plagiarization of the Egyptian sun god Horus. For example, inscribed about 3,500 years ago on the walls at the Temple of Luxor in Egypt are images of the Annunciation, the Miracle Conception, the Birth, and the Adoration of Horus. The images begin with Thoth announcing to the Virgin Isis that she will conceive Horus, then Neph, the Holy Ghost, impregnating the Virgin, and then the Virgin Birth and the Adoration. This is exactly the story of Jesus' miracle conception. In fact, the literary similarities between the Egyptian religion and the Christian religion are staggering. Plagiarism is continuous. The story of Noah and Noah's Ark is taken directly from tradition. The concept of the Great Flood is ubiquitous throughout the ancient world, with over 200 cited claims in different periods and times. However, one need look no further for a pre-Christian source than the Epic of Gilgamesh, written in 2600 BC. This story talks of a great flood commanded by God, an ark with saved animals upon it, and even the release and return of a dove, all held in common with the biblical story, among many other similarities. And then there is the plagiarized story of Moses. Upon Moses' birth, it is said that he was placed in a reed basket and set adrift in a river in order to avoid infanticide. He was later rescued by a daughter of royalty and raised by her as a prince. This baby in a basket story was lifted directly from the myth of Sargon of Akkad of around 2250 BC. Sargon was born, placed in a reed basket in order to avoid infanticide and set adrift in a river. He was in turn rescued and raised by Aki, a royal midwife. Furthermore, Moses is known as the lawgiver, the giver of the Ten Commandments, the Mosaic Law. However, the idea of a law being passed from God to a prophet up on a mountain is also a very old motif. Moses is just another lawgiver in a long line of lawgivers in mythological history. In India, Manu was the great lawgiver. In Crete, Minos ascended Mount Dicta, where Zeus gave him the sacred laws. While in Egypt, there was Mises, who carried stone tablets and upon them the laws of God were written. Manu, Minos, Mises, Moses. And as far as the Ten Commandments, they are taken outright from spell 125 in the Egyptian Book of the Dead. What the Book of the Dead phrased, I have not stolen, became thou shall not steal. I have not killed, became thou shall not kill. I have not told lies, became thou shall not bear false witness, and so forth. In fact, the Egyptian religion is likely the primary foundational basis for the Judeo-Christian theology. Baptism, afterlife, final judgment, virgin birth, death and resurrection, crucifixion, the Ark of the Covenant, circumcision, saviors, holy communion, great flood, Easter, Christmas, Passover, and many, many more are all attributes of Egyptian ideas long predating Christianity and Judaism. Justin Martyr, one of the first Christian historians and defenders, wrote, When we say that he, Jesus Christ, our teacher, was produced without sexual union, was crucified and died and rose again and ascended into heaven, we propound nothing different from what you believe regarding those who you esteem sons of Jupiter. In a different writing, Justin Martyr said, he was born of a virgin, except this in common with what you believe of Perseus. 
It's obvious that Justin and other early Christians knew how similar Christianity was to the pagan religions. However, Justin had a solution. As far as he was concerned, the devil did it. The devil had the foresight to come before Christ and create his characteristics in the pagan world. Fundamentalist Christianity, fascinating. These people actually believe the world is 12,000 years old. I swear to God. I actually asked one of these guys, okay, dinosaur fossils. He says, dinosaur fossils? God put those here to test our faith. I think God put you here to test my faith, dude. The Bible is nothing more than an astrotheological literary hybrid, just like nearly all religious myths before it. In fact, the aspect of transference of one character's attributes to a new character can be found within the book itself. In the Old Testament, there is the story of Joseph. Joseph was a prototype for Jesus. Joseph was born of a miracle birth. Jesus was born of a miracle birth. Joseph was of 12 brothers. Jesus had 12 disciples. Joseph was sold for 20 pieces of silver. Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver. Brother Judah suggests the sale of Joseph. Disciple Judas suggests the sale of Jesus. Joseph began his work at the age of 30. Jesus began his work at the age of 30. The parallels go on and on. Furthermore, is there any non-biblical historical evidence of any person living with the name Jesus, the son of Mary, who traveled about with 12 followers, healing people and the like? There are numerous historians who lived in and around the Mediterranean, either during or soon after the assumed life of Jesus. How many of these historians document this figure? Not one. However, to be fair, that doesn't mean defenders of the historical Jesus haven't claimed the contrary. Four historians are typically referenced to justify Jesus' existence. Pliny the Younger, Suetonius, and Tacitus are the first three. Each one of their entries consists of only a few sentences at best, and only referred to Christus or the Christ, which in fact is not a name but a title, it means the Anointed One. The fourth source is Josephus, and this source has been proven to be a forgery for hundreds of years. Sadly, it is still cited as truth. You would think that a guy who rose from the dead and ascended into heaven for all eyes to see and performed the wealth of miracles acclaimed to him would have made it into the historical record. It didn't because once the evidence is weighed, there are very high odds that the figure known as Jesus did not even exist. We don't want to be unkind, but we want to be factual. We don't want to cause hurt feelings, but we want to be academically correct in what we understand and know to be true. Christianity just is not based on truth. We find that Christianity was in fact nothing more than a Roman story developed politically. The reality is, Jesus was the solar deity of the Gnostic Christian sect. And like all other pagan gods, he was a mythical figure. It was the political establishment that sought to historize the Jesus figure for social control. By 325 AD in Rome, Emperor Constantine convened the Council of Nicaea. It was during this meeting that the politically motivated Christian doctrines were established, and thus began a long history of Christian bloodshed and spiritual fraud. And for the next 1600 years, the Vatican maintained a political stranglehold on all of Europe, leading to such joyous periods as the Dark Ages, along with enlightening events such as the Crusades and the Inquisition. Christianity, along with all other theistic belief systems, is the fraud of the age. It serves to detach the species from the natural world, and likewise each other. It supports blind submission to authority. It reduces human responsibility to the effect that God controls everything, 
and in turn awful crimes can be justified in the name of a divine pursuit. And most importantly, it empowers those who know the truth, but use the myth to manipulate and control societies. The religious myth is the most powerful device ever created and serves as the psychological soil upon which other myths can flourish. A myth is an idea that, while widely believed, is false. In a deeper sense, in the religious sense, a myth serves as an orienting and mobilizing story for a people. The focus is not on the story's relation to reality, but on its function. A story cannot function unless it is believed to be true in the community or the nation. It is not a matter of debate. If some people have the bad taste to raise the question of the truth of the sacred story, the keepers of the faith do not enter into debate with them. They ignore them or denounce them as blasphemers. It is wrong, blasphemous, and sinful for you to suggest, imply, or help other people come to the conclusion that the U.S. government killed 3,000 of its own citizens. scenes of an old building being purposely dynamited and blown up. Anybody who's ever watched a building being demolished on purpose knows that if you're going to do this, you have to get at the under infrastructure of a building and bring it down. The way the structure is collapsing, this was the result of something that was planned. It's not accidental that the first tower just happened to collapse and then the second tower just happened to collapse in exactly the same way. How they accomplished this, we don't know. The building collapsed to dust. You don't find a desk, you don't find a chair, you don't find a telephone, a computer. The biggest piece of a telephone I found was half of the keypad, and it was about this big. What happened to the concrete? The concrete was pulverized from river to river. There was dust powder, two, three inches thick. The concrete was just uh, pulverized. In the listening of those pictures, we've all seen too much on television before when a building was deliberately destroyed by world place dynamite to knock it down. If, if, if they had detonated, that yes, was, detonated. if they were planned yes. to take down our building. I heard a second explosion. There was a uh, heavy duty explosion. And then there's a secondary explosion and then the subsequent collapses. An explosion blew and it knocked everybody over. To me it sounded like an explosion. It sounded like gunfire. Bang, 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 bang. And then all of a sudden, three big explosions. And we heard a big explosion coming down. And then the entire top of the building just blew up. We saw some kind of explosion. By the force of the explosions. Big explosion. Blew it back into the eighth floor. Then we get to the lobby. This is a big explosion. The lobby looked as though a bomb had exploded there. A huge explosion now raining debris. It's been a huge explosion. Huge explosion that we all heard and felt. We just witnessed some kind of follow-up explosion. We heard a very loud blast explosion. A secondary explosion at Tower 1 camp. That is another bomb going off. He thinks that there were actually devices that were planted in the building. Planted in the building.
I don't think anybody could have predicted that they would try to use an airplane as a missile, a hijacked airplane as a missile. Nobody in our government, at least, and I don't think the prior government that could envision flying airplanes into buildings. No specific threat involving uh, really a domestic operation or involving uh, what happened, obviously, uh, the city's uh, airliner and so There uh, were uh, no warning signs that I'm aware of. USA Today reports that in the two years before the attacks on September the 11th, NORAD conducted exercises using hijacked airliners as weapons. And one target was the World Trade Center. In confidential documents from the Philippines obtained by CNN, the plan was clear. He will board any American commercial aircraft, control its cockpit, and dive it at the CIA headquarters. Other buildings targeted the Pentagon and the World Trade Center. Security in counterterrorism was blinking red, in the words of George Tennant, that the warnings of an imminent attack were so severe that something dramatic should have been done. It was unparalleled. Uh, instead, our president went on a month-long vacation. The head of Pakistani intelligence at the ISI, Mahmoud Ahmed, requested Omar Sheikh to wire $100,000 to Mohammed Atta, who was the lead hijacker. Did hijacker Mohammed Atta received wire transfers via Pakistan. The man sending the money to Atta is believed to be Ahmed Umar Saeed Sheikh. Omar Sheikh admitted he was supported by the Pakistan government's intelligence service, the ISI. Although we are told that four or five of the alleged hijackers were on each of the flights, if so, their names should have been on the flight manifest. But the flight manifests that have been released contain neither the names of the alleged hijackers nor any Arab names whatsoever. We know that the men who were supposedly the hijackers had their houses, cars, credit cards paid for by the U.S. government. They were, in truth, agents. Evidence was also apparently planted. The passport of one of the hijackers on Flight 11 was allegedly found in the rubble. Goes through the fireball, through the side of the plane, and comes down the ground unscathed. But something happened. For six months they reported they had this passport. Boy, we've got it, we've got the proof. And then the guy stood up and was alive. Several of these 19 men are still alive. Of course we're after Saddam Hussein, I mean uh, bin Laden, he's, he's, he's... January 2001, the Bush administration orders the FBI and intelligence agencies to back off investigations involving the bin Laden family, including two of Osama bin Laden's relatives, who were living, guess where, in Falls Church, Virginia, right next to CIA headquarters. When he was already America's most wanted criminal, he reportedly spent two weeks in the American hospital in Dubai, was treated by an American doctor, and visited by the local CIA agent. We have not seen one piece of evidence that links Osama bin Laden directly to the planning stages of September 11th. This failure to provide proof was later said to be unnecessary because bin Laden, in a video allegedly found in Afghanistan, admitted responsibility for the attacks. This confession is now widely cited as proof. But the man in this video has darker skin, fuller cheeks, and a broader nose than the Osama bin Laden of all other videos. We again seem to have planted evidence. In 1976, Osama's older brother Salim bin Laden 
hired a man in Texas by the name of Jim Bath to handle all the investments in the United States for the Bin Laden family. Jim Bath also happens to be a personal, almost lifelong friend and former Air National Guard pilot with George W. Bush. The connections between the Bushes and the Bin Ladens become much more clear when George Herbert Walker Bush made trips to Saudi Arabia in 1998 and 2000 to meet with the Bin Laden family on behalf of a company called the Carlyle Group. How could anyone fly a 60-ton, 125-foot-wide, 44-foot-tall plane through this obstacle course? The aircraft, before striking the Pentagon, reportedly executed a 270-degree downward spiral, and yet Hani Han Ewer was known as a terrible pilot who could not safely fly even a small plane. No seats, no luggage, no bodies. Nothing but bricks and limestone. The official explanation is that the intense heat from the jet fuel vaporized the entire plane. Flight 77 had two Rolls-Royce engines made of steel and titanium alloy and weighed six tons each. It is scientifically impossible that 12 tons of steel and titanium was vaporized by jet fuel. We're also told that the bodies were able to be identified either by their fingerprints or by the DNA. So what kind of fire can vaporize aluminum and tempered steel and yet leave, leave human bodies intact? From my close-up inspection, uh, there's no evidence of a plane having crashed anywhere near the Pentagon. And as I said, the only pieces left uh, that you can see are, are small enough that you could pick up in your hand. Shortly after the strike, government agents picked up debris and carried it off. The entire lawn was covered with dirt and gravel so that any remaining forensic evidence was literally covered up. The videos from security cameras, which would show what really hit the Pentagon, were immediately confiscated by agents of the FBI, and the Department of Justice has to this day refused to release them. If these videos would prove that the Pentagon was really hit by a 757, most of us would assume the government would release them. It looks like there's nothing there except for a hole in the ground. Uh, basically, that's right. The only thing you could see from where we were uh, was a big gouge in the earth and some broken trees. We could see some people working, walking around in the area, but from where we could see, there wasn't much left. Any large pieces of debris at all? No, there was nothing, nothing that you could distinguish that a plane had crashed there. pancake theory, according to which the fires, while not melting the steel, heated it up sufficiently to cause the floors weakened by the airplane strikes to break loose from the steel columns, and this started a chain reaction. So you would expect then from that theory, which is the official theory, to see a whole stack of floors piled up on top of each other and then a spindle of core columns standing too. The core of each of the twin towers consisted of 47 massive steel columns. If the floors had broken loose from them, these columns would have still been sticking up into the air a thousand feet. The plane did not cut all those core columns. We designed the buildings to take the impact of the Boeing 707 uh, hitting the building at any location. The building probably could sustain multiple impacts of jetliners. That the plane flew straight into the building. Straight through, through him, right. So you're saying that the building was actually designed to cope with a hole like that and right. then still yeah, survive? Yeah, it was, it was. If you had dropped, say, a billiard ball 
from the top of the World Trade Center, 110 floors up there. It would have taken 8 to 10 seconds to hit the ground, encountering no resistance whatsoever. The Twin Towers came down in nearly free fall speed. 200,000 tons of steel shatters and explodes outwards over 500 feet. This means that floors shattered at an average rate of about 10 floors per second. There is no scenario for a pancake effect of buildings falling that allows them to fall at the rate of free fall. Now what can do that? What, what can move mass out of the way? Explosives. Forty-seven huge steel columns going up the core. And they're interconnected. How do you get uh, them to fail simultaneously so the core disappears? It looks like those core columns were cut. The way we do this is by cutting the beam at an angle. I started looking at the molten metal. All three buildings, both towers in the rubble, in the basement areas, and building seven, there's these pools of molten metal. You'd get down below and you'd see molten steel. Molten steel running down the channel rails. Like you're in a foundry. Mm -hmm. The molten steel was found three, four, and five weeks later when the rubble was being removed. He said that molten steel was also found underneath World Trade Center 7. So I'm looking through the official reports. What do they say about the molten metal? They say nothing. Now wait a minute. This is important evidence. So where did that come from? Thermite is so hot that it'll just cut through steel, through structural steel, for example, like a knife through butter. The products are molten iron and aluminum oxide, which goes off primarily as a dust. You know those enormous dust clouds? You can imagine when you assemble these chemicals on a large scale. Molten metal pools under both towers after they collapsed and Building 7. Now, Building 7 wasn't even hit by a, a jet. Part of the problem is that most people simply don't know much about Building 7 due to the extraordinary secrecy surrounding this collapse. And this was a 47-story skyscraper. This building fell at 525. It was not hit by a plane. This building had fires on only two or three floors. And it was brought down by what we know was a controlled demolition. Demolitions, they look just like that. You know, a kink in the middle, and then that building just comes straight down almost at free fall speed. They first blow one of the central columns so the building falls in on itself. Building 7 had a classic crimp or wedge. Its central column was blown out first so it didn't structurally damage buildings just a few feet away from it. Our office was on the B1 level. As I was talking to a supervisor at A46, and all of a sudden we hear, boom! An explosion so hard that pushed us upwards. And it came from the basement between the B2 level and the B3 level. And when I went to verbalize, we hear, boom! The impact of the plane on the top. As I'm walking by the main freight car of the building in the corridor, that's, that's when I got blown. I mean, the impact of the explosion threw me to the floor, and that's when everything started happening. All of a sudden, a big impact happened again, and all the ceiling tile was falling down, the light fixtures were falling. You know, you got to go clear across the hole from one to, one to two World Trade Center, and then all of a sudden, it happened all over again. Well, something else hit us to the floor. Right in the basement, you felt it. Walls were caving in. Everything that was going on, 
I, I mean, I know people that got killed in the basement. I know people that got broken legs in, their, in the basement. People that got reconstructive surgery because the walls hit them in the face. According to standard operating procedure, if an FAA flight controller notices anything that suggests a possible hijacking, the controller is to contact a superior. If the problem cannot be fixed within about a minute, the superior is to ask NORAD, the North American Aerospace Command, to send up or scramble jet fighters to find out what is going on. NORAD then issues a scramble order to the nearest Air Force base with fighters on alert. But although interceptions usually occur within 10 or so minutes, in this case, 80 or so minutes had elapsed before fighters were even airborne. It's a mind-bending anomaly. Not a single U.S. Air Force interceptor turns a wheel until it's too late. There are no jets at all. What if they were so confused and had been so deliberately confused that they couldn't respond? The reason that they didn't know where to go was because a number of conflicting and overlapping uh, war game exercises were taking place. It involved the insertion of false radar blips onto radar screens in the Northeast Air Defense Sector. Lieutenant Team U, we have uh, a problem here. We have a hijacked aircraft headed towards New York. We need someone to scramble some S-16s or something up there to help us out. Is this, is this real world or exercise? Is this, is this real world or exercise? There was another exercise, Vigilant Warrior, which was in fact, according to a NORAD source, a live fly hijack drill being conducted at the same time. With only eight available fighter aircraft, and they have to be dispatched in pairs, they were dealing with as many as 22 possible hijacks on the day of 9-11, and they couldn't separate the war game exercises from the actual hijacks. Page 172. The U.S. government has not been able to determine the origin of the money used for the 9-11 attacks. Ultimately, the question is of little practical significance. The American authorities have not managed to trace the source of the funding. And then the most amazingly disingenuous statement, ultimately, is it of little consequence. It is of massive consequence. Doesn't it matter who paid for 9-11? The collapse of Building 7 has been recognized as especially difficult to explain. The 9-11 Commission report implicitly admitted that it could not explain the collapse of this building by not even mentioning it. Mr. President, why are you and the Vice President insisting on appearing together before the 9-11 Commission? Because the 9-11 Commission, Commission wants to ask us questions. That's why we're meeting, and I look forward to meeting with them and answering their questions. Uh, why you're appearing together rather than separately, which was their request? Because it's a good chance for both of us to answer questions that the 9-11 Commission is uh, looking forward to asking us, and I'm looking forward to answering them. Let's see. Do you think they should be able to stand up and, and, and speak their own words? They should go under oath. They should be, yeah, in public. Don't you think that the families deserve to have a transcript or to be able to see what you <laughs> Adam, said? Adam, you asked me that question yesterday. For an I got the today. same answer, yeah. The final report was a unanimous report. That means that if there was a single commissioner who had any objection about anything, that fact would be dropped from the report. We have found out that he not only served on the transition team of the Bush administration, that he was a person who wrote a draft memo for the setup of the Bush administration's National Security Council, that he was an individual who wrote the preemptive war strategy that was eventually used for the war in Iraq, that he is a close friend of Condoleezza Rice's. We want him to resign. There is literally nothing in the 9-11 report that the Bush administration did not approve of. We can understand, therefore, why the Commission, under Zelikow's leadership, would have ignored all the evidence that would point to the truth, that 9-11 was a false flag operation intended to authorize the doctrines and funds needed for a new level of imperial mobilization.
armed with knives, armed with chemical, biological, nuclear weapons. Fanatics, terrorists, September 11th. September 11th, killers, September 11th. Terrorists, terrorists of Al-Qaeda, terrorists, nuclear weapons, terrorists. 9-11, terror, terror, terrorists, evil. September 11th, September 11th. The terrorists, war and danger. September 11th, terrorism, global terrorism, terrorism, terrorist. Terrorist, 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 the terror. Terrorist, terrorist, terrorism. September 11th, global terrorism, terrorist, terror, terrorism. September 11th, world terrorism, terrorist, terrorism. September 11th, global terrorism. September the 11th, terror, 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 terror. Weapons of mass destruction. September the 11th, September the 11th, terrorist. The evil terrorist, 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 no. Terrorism. The words are hypnotically repeated. Terrorism, terrorist, terrorist threat, and of course, believed to be linked to Al Qaeda. But it's the so-called war on terrorism that's in our faces practically 24-7 as the inescapable focus of our existence. One day, our grandchildren will look back on this time and ask, how was the war on terror won? The entire U.S. ruling class, ruling elite, comes to see terrorism as the preferred means, indeed the only means, to provide social cohesion, to provide an enemy image for the society to keep it together. According to neocon theory from Carl Schmitt, you have to have an enemy image in order to have a society. It's a very dangerous thing because now it means that the entire social order, the political parties, intellectual life, politics in general, all based on a monstrous myth, monstrous myth. Look, the CIA has done in this country, what they've done to us is unbelievable. Look at the terrorist acts that have occurred. The CIA behind most, if not all of them. We had the Marine Barracks, their embassy in Kenya. We had Pan Am, 103. We had the USS Cole. Uh, we had Oklahoma City. We had the World Trade Center in 1993. That helped the terrorists blow up the World Trade Center the first time. They built the bomb. They, they got the driver's license. The informant, the FBI informant, fellow named Salam, a 43-year-old former Egyptian uh, army officer, he was given the assignment to put the bomb together. And he went to his supervisor, his FBI supervisor, and said, we're going to put a dummy bomb in here, right? He, and the FBI supervisor said, no, we're going to put a real bomb. The FBI actually carried out the attack on the World Trade Center in 1993. They actually hired Ahmad Salam and paid him $1 million and gave him real explosives, a detonator, and told him to build a bomb and to give it to the foolish people that he was controlling to allow them to attack the World Trade Center complex. Unfortunately for them, there were only six people killed, not enough to pass the legislation. So what happened is two years later, April 19, 1995, down comes Oklahoma City, uh, Murrah building, 168 people killed. One year later, the anti-terrorism legislation that takes away any of our constitutional rights and civil liberties is passed. Because at half past nine this morning, we were actually running an exercise for a, over a company of a thousand people in London based on simultaneous bombs going off precisely at the railway stations that happened this morning. So I still have the hairs on the back of my neck standing upright. So you get this quite straight. You were running uh, a, an exercise to see where, how you would cope with this and it happened while you were running the exercise. Precisely. supposed to believe is some kind of coincidence, there was also an anti-terrorist drill going on on 7-7. And again, just like 9-11,
they were talking about attacks on the same targets, the same kind of tube stations, and exactly the same time as the actual attack happened, providing some kind of cover for what must be operations orchestrated in some way by the state. I am absolutely appalled at how much people in this country do not think. We are given to understand that, a, uh, that an Arabic guy out there in, up in the mountains financed the most elaborate attack on this country. Do you think some people in a cave, do you think some people in a cave were able to have NORAD stand down? Do you think that people in a cave were able to have all of this happen? And when I think about how many Americans were killed in New York City and believing as I do that this thing was a setup job, this is a textbook operation that Nazis used and they've used it over and over again. America has been suckered in one more time. I don't have to tell you things are bad. Everybody knows things are bad. The dollar buys a nickel's worth. Banks are going bust. Shopkeepers keep a gun under the counter. Punks are running wild in the street. There's nobody anywhere who seems to know what to do, and there's no end to it. We know the air is unfit to breathe, and our food is unfit to eat. We sit watching our TVs while some local newscaster tells us that today we had 15 homicides and 63 violent crimes, as if that's the way it's supposed to be. We know things are bad, worse than bad. They're crazy. It's like everything everywhere is going crazy, so we don't go out anymore. We sit in the house, and slowly the world we're living in is getting smaller, and all we say is, please, at least leave us alone in our living rooms. Let me have my toaster and my TV and my steel-belted radios, and I won't say anything. Just leave us alone. Well, I'm not going to leave you alone. I want you to get mad. I don't want you to protest. I don't want you to riot. I don't want you to write to your congressmen because I wouldn't know what to tell you to write. I don't know what to do about the depression and the inflation and the Russians and the crime in the street. All I know is that first, you've got to get mad. You've got to say, I'm a human being. God damn it. My life has value. I'm all right. I told him, said I was leaving the building, I was fine, I am bang. Two three of us, two broken windows. Oh God! commenced in Europe in 1939, it was realized that the American people had no intention of entering the war. But they believed that this country could be enticed into the war in very much the same way that it was enticed into the last one. They planned first to prepare the United States for foreign war under the guise of American defense. Second, to involve us in the war step by step without our realization. Third, to create a series of incidents which would force us into the actual conflict. These plans were, of course, to be covered and assisted by the full power of their propaganda. 
Our theaters soon became filled with plays portraying the glory of war. Newsreels lost all semblance of objectivity. And they have used the war to justify the restriction of congressional power and the assumption of dictatorial procedures on the part of the president and his appointees. A fear campaign was inaugurated. We cannot allow the natural passions and prejudices of other peoples to lead our country to destruction. The American Revolutionary War began as the American colonies sought to detach from England and its oppressive monarchy. Though many reasons are cited for the revolution, one in particular sticks out as the prime cause, that King George III of England outlawed the interest-free, independent currency the colonies were producing and using for themselves, in turn forcing them to borrow money from the Central Bank of England at interest, immediately putting the colonies into debt. And, as Benjamin Franklin later wrote, The refusal of King George III to allow the colonies to operate an honest money system which freed the ordinary man from the clutches of the money manipulators was probably the prime cause of the revolution. In 1783, America won its independence from England. However, its battle against the central bank concept and the corrupt, greed-filled men associated with it had just begun. So what is a central bank? A central bank is an institution that produces the currency of an entire nation. Based on historical precedent, two specific powers are inherent in central banking practice. The control of interest rates and the control of the money supply or inflation. The central bank does not simply supply a government's economy with money, it loans it to them at interest. Then, through the use of increasing and decreasing the supply of money, the central bank regulates the value of the currency being issued. It is critical to understand that the entire structure of this system can only produce one thing in the long run. Debt. It doesn't take a lot of ingenuity to figure this scam out. For every single dollar produced by the central bank is loaned at interest. That means every single dollar produced is actually the dollar plus a certain percent of debt based on that dollar. And since the central bank has the monopoly over the production of the currency for the entire country, and they loan each dollar out with immediate debt attached to it, where does the money to pay for the debt come from? It can only come from the central bank again, which means the central bank has to perpetually increase its money supply to temporarily cover the outstanding debt created, which in turn, since that new money is loaned out at interest as well, creates even more debt. The end result of this system without fail is slavery, for it is impossible for the government and thus the public to ever come out of the self-generating debt. The founding fathers of this country were well aware of this. By the early 20th century, the U.S. had already implemented and removed a few central banking systems, which were swindled into place by ruthless banking interests. At this time, the dominant families in the banking and business world were the Rockefellers, the Morgans, the Warburgs, the Rothschilds. And in the early 1900s, they sought to push, once again, legislation to create another central bank. However, they knew the government and public were very weary of such an institution, so they needed to create an incident to affect public opinion. 
So, J.P. Morgan, publicly considered a financial luminary at the time, exploited his mass influence by publishing rumors that a prominent bank in New York was insolvent or bankrupt. Morgan knew this would cause mass hysteria, which would affect other banks as well. And it did. The public, in fear of losing their deposits, immediately began mass withdrawals. Consequently, the banks were forced to call in their loans, causing the recipients to sell their property, and thus a spiral of bankruptcies, repossessions, and turmoil emerged. Putting the pieces together a few years later, Frederick Allen of Life magazine wrote, The Morgan interests took advantage to precipitate the panic, guiding it shrewdly as it progressed. Unaware of the fraud, the Panic of 1907 led to a congressional investigation headed by Senator Nelson Aldrich, who had intimate ties to the banking cartels and later became part of the Rockefeller family through marriage. The commission, led by Aldrich, recommended a central bank should be implemented so a panic like 1907 could never happen again. This was the spark the international bankers needed to initiate their plan. In 1910, a secret meeting was held at a J.P. Morgan estate on Jekyll Island off the coast of Georgia. It was there that the central banking bill called the Federal Reserve Act was written. This legislation was written by bankers, not lawmakers. This meeting was so secretive, so concealed from government and public knowledge, that the ten or so figures who attended disguised their names when en route to the island. After this bill was constructed, it was then handed over to their political frontman, Senator Nelson Aldrich, to push through Congress. And in 1913, with heavy political sponsorship by the bankers, Woodrow Wilson became president, having already agreed to sign the Federal Reserve Act in exchange for campaign support. And two days before Christmas, when most of Congress was at home with their families, the Federal Reserve Act was voted in, and Wilson in turn made it law. Later, Woodrow Wilson wrote, in regret, Congressman Lewis McFadden also expressed the truth after the passage of the bill. A world banking system was being set up here, a super state controlled by international bankers, acting together to enslave the world for their own pleasure. The Fed has usurped the government. Now, the public was told that the Federal Reserve System was an economic stabilizer, and inflation and economic crises were a thing of the past. Well, as history has shown, nothing is further from the truth. The fact is, the international bankers now had a streamlined machine to expand their personal ambitions. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! For example, from 1914 to 1919, the Fed increased the money supply by nearly 100%, resulting in extensive loans to small banks and the public. Then, in 1920, the Fed called in mass percentages of the outstanding money supply, thus resulting in the supporting banks having to call in huge numbers of loans, and, just like 1907, bank runs, bankruptcy, and collapse occurred. Over 5,400 competitive banks outside of the Federal Reserve System collapsed, further consolidating the monopoly of a small group of international bankers. Privy to this crime, Congressman Lindbergh stepped up and said in 1921, under the Federal Reserve Act, panics are scientifically created. The present panic is the first scientifically created one, worked out as we figure a mathematical equation. However, the panic of 1920 was just a warm-up. From 1921 to 1929, the Fed again increased the money supply, resulting once again in extensive loans to the public and banks. There was also a fairly new type of loan called a margin loan in the stock market. Very simply, the margin loan allowed an investor to put down only 10% of a stock's price, with the other 90% being loaned through the broker. In other words, a person could own $1,000 worth of stock with only $100 down. This method was very popular in the roaring 1920s, as everyone seemed to be making money in the market. However, there was a catch to this loan. It could be called in at any time and had to be paid within 24 hours. This is termed a margin call, and the typical result of a margin call is the selling of the stock purchased with the loan. 
So, a few months before October in 1929, J.D. Rockefeller, Bernard Barak, and other insiders quietly exited the market. And on October 24, 1929, the New York financiers who furnished the margin loans started calling them in in mass. This sparked an instantaneous, massive sell-off in the market, for everyone had to cover the margin loans. It then triggered mass bank runs for the same reason, in turn collapsing over 16,000 banks, enabling the conspiring international bankers to not only buy up rival banks at a discount, but to also buy up whole corporations at pennies on the dollar. It was the greatest robbery in American history. But that didn't stop there. Rather than expanding the money supply in order to recover from this economic collapse, the Fed actually contracted it, fueling one of the largest depressions in history. Once again outraged, Congressman Lewis McFadden, a longtime opponent of the banking cartels, began bringing impeachment proceedings against the Federal Reserve Board, saying of the crash and depression, it was a carefully contrived occurrence. International bankers sought to bring about a condition of despair so that they might emerge the rulers of us all. Not surprisingly, and after two previous assassination attempts, McFadden was poisoned at a banquet before he could push for the impeachment. Now, having reduced the society to squalor, the Federal Reserve bankers decided that the gold standard should be removed. In order to do this, they needed to acquire the remaining gold in the system. So, under the pretense of helping to end the depression, came the 1933 gold seizure. Under the threat of imprisonment for 10 years, everyone in America was required to turn in all gold bullion to the treasury, essentially robbing the public of what little wealth they had left. And at the end of 1933, the gold standard was abolished. If you look at a dollar bill from before 1933, it says it is redeemable in gold. You look at a dollar bill today, it says it is legal tender, which means it is backed by absolutely nothing. It is worthless paper. The only thing that gives our money value is how much of it is in circulation. Therefore, the power to regulate the money supply is also the power to regulate its value, which is also the power to bring entire economies and societies to its knees. It's important to clearly understand, the Federal Reserve is a private corporation. It is about as federal as Federal Express. It makes its own policies and is under virtually no regulation by the U.S. government. It is a private bank that loans all the currency at interest to the government, completely consistent with the fraudulent central banking model that the country sought to escape from when it declared independence in the American Revolutionary War. Now, going back to 1913, the Federal Reserve Act was not the only unconstitutional bill pushed through Congress. They also pushed the Federal Income Tax. It's worthwhile to point out that the American public's ignorance towards the Federal Income Tax is a testament to how dumbed down and oblivious the American population really is. First of all, the Federal Income Tax is completely unconstitutional, as it is a direct, unapportioned tax. All direct taxes have to be apportioned to be legal based on the Constitution. Secondly, the required number of states in order to ratify the amendment to allow the income tax was never met, and this has even been cited in modern court cases. Third, at the present day, roughly 25% of the average worker's income is taken via this tax. And guess where that money goes? It goes to pay the interest on the currency being produced by the fraudulent Federal Reserve Bank, a system that does not have to exist at all. The money you make working almost three months out of the year goes almost literally into the pockets of the international bankers who own the private Federal Reserve Bank. And fourth, even with the fraudulent government claim as to the legality of the income tax, there is literally no statute, no law in existence that requires you to pay this tax, period. I really expected that, of course, there's a law that you can point to in the law book, the code that requires you to file a tax return. Of course there is. I was at that point where I couldn't find the statute that clearly made a person liable. Uh, at least not me and uh, most people I know and I had no no choice in my mind except to to resign based on the research that I did throughout the year 2000 and that I'm still doing I have not found that law I've asked uh, Congress we've asked a lot of people in the IRS the IRS commissioners helpers they can't answer because if they answer the American people are gonna know that this whole thing is a fraud I haven't uh, filed an income, federal income tax return since I left. I have not filed a tax return since 1999. The income tax is nothing less 
been the enslavement of the entire country. Now, the control of the economy and the perpetual robbery of wealth is only one side of the Rubik's Cube the bankers hold in their hands. The next tool for profit and control is war. Since the inception of the Federal Reserve in 1913, a number of large and small wars have commenced. The three most pronounced were World War I, World War II, and Vietnam. World War I. In 1914, European wars broke out centered around England and Germany. The American public wanted nothing to do with the war. In turn, President Woodrow Wilson publicly declared neutrality. However, under the surface, the U.S. administration was looking for any excuse it could find to enter it. In a noted observation by Secretary of State William Jennings, the large banking interests were deeply interested in the World War because of the wide opportunities for large profits. It's important to understand that the most lucrative thing that can happen for the international bankers is war, for it forces the country to borrow even more money from the Federal Reserve Bank at interest. Woodrow Wilson's top advisor and mentor was Colonel Edward House, a man with intimate connections with the international bankers who wanted in the war. In a documented conversation between Colonel House, Wilson's advisor, and Sir Edward Grey, the Foreign Secretary of England, regarding how to get America into the war, Grey inquired, What will Americans do if Germans sink an ocean liner with American passengers on board? House responded, I believe that a flame of indignation would sweep the United States, and that by itself would be sufficient to carry us into war. So, on May 7, 1915, on essentially the suggestion of Sir Edward Grey, a ship called the Lusitania was deliberately sent into German-controlled waters, where German military vessels were known to be. And, as expected, German U-boats torpedoed the ship, exploding stored ammunition, killing 1,200 people. To further understand the deliberate nature of this setup, the German embassy actually put advertisements in the New York Times telling people that if they boarded the Lusitania, they did so at their own risk, as such a ship sailing from America to England through the war zone would be liable to destruction. In turn, and as anticipated, the sinking of the Lusitania caused a wave of anger among the American population, and America entered the war a short time after. The First World War caused 323,000 American deaths. J.D. Rockefeller made $200 million off of it. Not to mention the war cost about $30 billion for America, most of which was borrowed from the Federal Reserve Bank at interest, furthering the profits of the international bankers. World War II. On December 7, 1941, Japan attacked the American fleet at Pearl Harbor, triggering our entry into that war. President Franklin D. Roosevelt declared the attack was a day that will live in infamy. A day of infamy indeed, but not because of the alleged surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. After 60 years of surfacing information, it is clear that not only was the attack on Pearl Harbor known weeks in advance, it was outright wanted and provoked. Roosevelt, whose family had been New York bankers since the 18th century, whose uncle Frederick was on the original Federal Reserve Board, was very sympathetic to the interests of the international bankers, and the interest was to enter the war, as as we've seen, nothing is more profitable for international bankers than war. In a journal entry by Roosevelt's Secretary of War, Henry Stimson, dated November 25th, 1941, he documented a conversation he had with Roosevelt. The question was, how should we maneuver them into firing the first shot? It was desirable to make sure the Japanese be the ones to do this, so that there should remain no doubt as to who were the aggressors. In the months leading up to the attack on Pearl Harbor, Roosevelt had done almost everything in his power to anger the Japanese, showing a posture of aggression. He halted all of Japan's imports of American petroleum. He froze all the Japanese assets in the United States. He made public loans to nationalist China and supplied military aid to the British, both enemies of Japan in the war, which, by the way, is completely in violation of international war rules. And on December 4th, three days before the attack, Australian intelligence told Roosevelt about a Japanese task force moving towards Pearl Harbor. Roosevelt ignored it. So, as hoped and allowed, on December 7, 1941, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, killing 2,400 soldiers. Before Pearl Harbor, 83% of the American public wanted nothing to do with the war. After Pearl Harbor, one million men volunteered for the war. It is important to note, Nazi Germany's war effort was largely supported by two organizations, one of which was called IG Farben. IG Farben produced 84% of Germany's explosives, and even the Zyklon B used in the concentration camps to kill millions. 
One of the unspoken partners of IG Farben was J.D. Rockefeller's Standard Oil Company in America. In fact, the German Air Force could not operate without a special additive patented by Rockefeller Standard Oil. The drastic bombing of London by Nazi Germany, for example, was made possible by a $20 million sale of fuel to IG Farben by the Rockefeller Standard Oil Company. This is just one small point on the topic of how American business funded both sides of World War II. One other treasonous organization worth mentioning is the Union Banking Corporation of New York City. Not only did it finance numerous aspects of Hitler's rise to power, along with actual materials during the war, it was also a Nazi money laundering bank, which was eventually exposed for having millions of dollars of Nazi money in its vaults. The Union Banking Corporation of New York was eventually seized for violations of the Trading with the Enemy Act. Guess who the director and vice president of the Union Bank was? Prescott Bush, our current president's grandfather, and of course our former president's father. Keep that in mind when considering the moral and political dispositions of the Bush family. Vietnam The United States' official declaration of war on North Vietnam in 1964 came after an alleged incident involving two U.S. destroyers being attacked by North Vietnamese PT boats in the Gulf of Tonkin. This was known as the Gulf of Tonkin Incident. This single situation was the catalytic pretext for massive troop deployment and full-fledged warfare. One problem, however, the attack on the U.S. destroyers by Vietnamese PT boats never happened. It was a completely staged event to have an excuse to enter the war. Former Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara stated years later that the Gulf of Tonkin incident was a mistake, while many other insiders and officers have come forward, relaying that it was a contrived farce, a complete lie. Once in the war, it was business as usual. In October 1966, President Lyndon Johnson lifted trading restrictions on the Soviet bloc, knowing full well that the Soviets were providing upwards of 80% of North Vietnam's war supplies. Consequently, Rockefeller interests financed factories in the Soviet Union, which the Soviets used to manufacture military equipment and send it to North Vietnam. However, the funding of both sides of this conflict was only one side of the coin. In 1985, Vietnam's rules of engagement were declassified. This detailed what American troops were and were not allowed to do in the war. It included absurdities like North Vietnamese anti-aircraft missile systems could not be bombed until they were known to be fully operational. No enemy could be pursued once they crossed the border of Laos or Cambodia. And most revealing of all, the most critical strategic targets were not allowed to be attacked unless initiated by high military officials. Apart from these imposed ludicrous limitations, North Vietnam was informed of these restrictions and therefore could base entire strategies around the limitations of the American forces. This is why the war went on so long. And the bottom line is this, the Vietnam War was never meant to be won, just sustained. This war for profit resulted in 58,000 American deaths and 3 million dead Vietnamese. So, where are we now? September 11th was the jumpstart for what is now an accelerated agenda by the ruthless elite. It was a staged war pretext no different than the sinking of the Lusitania, the provoking of Pearl Harbor, and the Gulf of Tonkin lie. In fact, if 9-11 wasn't a planned war pretext, it would be an exception to the rule. It has been used to launch two unprovoked illegal wars, one against Iraq and one against Afghanistan. However, 9-11 was a pretext for another war as well, the war against you. The Patriot Act, Homeland Security, the Military Tribunals Act, and other legislations are all completely and entirely designed to destroy your civil liberties and limit your ability to fight back against what is coming. Currently in the United States, unannounced to most brainwashed Americans, your home can be searched without a warrant, without you being home, you can in turn be arrested with no charges revealed to you, detained indefinitely with no access to a lawyer, and legally tortured, all under the suspicion that you might be a terrorist. If you need a painted picture of what is happening in this country, let's recognize how history repeats itself. In February 1933, Hitler staged a false flag attack, burning down his own German parliament building, the Reichstag, and blamed it on communist terrorists. Within the next few weeks, he passed the Enabling Act, which completely eradicated the German constitution, destroying people's liberties. He then led a series of preemptive wars, all justified to the German people as necessary to maintaining 
Homeland Security. network of terrorists and every government that supports them. It's time to wake up. The people in power go out of their way to make sure that you are perpetually misled and manipulated. The majority's perception of reality, especially in the political arena, is not their own. It is shrewdly imposed upon them without them even knowing it. For example, the public at large actually believes the invasion of Iraq is going badly, as sectarian violence doesn't seem to stop. What the public fails to see is that the destabilization of Iraq is exactly what the people behind the government want. This war is to be sustained so the region can be divided up, domination of the oil maintained, continual profits reaped for the defense contractors, and most importantly, permanent military bases established to be used as a launching pad against other oil-bearing, non-conforming countries such as Iran and Syria. For further implication that the civil war and destabilization is purely intentional, in 2005, two elite British SAS officers were arrested by Iraqi police after being caught driving around in their car shooting at civilians while dressed up as Arabs. After being arrested and taken to a jail in Basra, the British Army immediately requested the release of these men. When the Basra government refused, British tanks came in and physically broke out the men from the Basra prison. If you wish to destroy an area, how do you do it? Well, there are two ways. You can go in there and bomb it and so forth, but that is not very efficient. What you do is you try to get the people in that area to kill each other and to destroy their own territory, their own farms. And that's what's been done in that area. The way in which you destroy an opponent is get him to destroy himself by dividing his ranks against one another. Then you feed both sides. You have agents feeding both sides, inflaming both sides, and they kill each other off. And it's time that some of us woke up to this reality to understand that people who try to maintain empires and create empires do it by manipulating the people they're trying to conquer you might want to ask yourself why the entire culture is utterly saturated with mass media entertainment from all sides. While the educational system in America continues its stupefying downward slide since the U.S. government decided to take over and subsidize the public school system. What your government pays for, it gets. When we understand that, then we look at government-financed institutions of education and see the kind of students and the kind of education that's being turned out by these government finance schools, logic will tell you that if what is being turned out in those schools was not in accord with what the state and the federal government wanted, then it would change it. The bottom line is that the government is getting what they have ordered. They do not want your children to be educated. They do not want you to think too much. That is why our country and our world has become so proliferated with entertainments, mass media, television shows, amusement parks, drugs, alcohol, and every kind of entertainment to keep the human mind entertained so that you don't get in the way of important people by doing too much thinking you had better wake up and understand that there are people who are guiding your life and you don't even know it. We're in a lot of trouble because you people and 62 million other Americans are listening to me right now because less than 3% of you people read books because less than 15% of you read newspapers 
Because the only truth you know is what you get over this tube. Right now, there is a whole, an entire generation that never knew anything that didn't come out of this tube. This tube is the gospel, the ultimate revelation. This tube can make or break presidents, popes, Prime Ministers, this tube is the most awesome goddamn force in the whole godless world. And woe is us if it all falls into the hands of the wrong people. And when the largest company in the world controls the most awesome goddamn propaganda force in the whole godless world, who knows what shit will be peddled for truth on this network. So you listen to me. Listen to me. Television is not the truth. Television is a goddamn amusement park. Television is a circus, a carnival, a traveling troupe of acrobats, storytellers, dancers, singers, jugglers, sideshow freaks, lion tamers, and football players. We're in the boredom killing business. But you people sit there day after day, night after night, all ages, colors, creeds. We're all you know. You're beginning to believe the illusions we're spinning here. You're beginning to think that the tube is reality and that your own lives are unreal. You do whatever the tube tells you. You dress like the tube. You eat like the tube. You raise your children like the tube. You even think like the tube. This is mass madness, you maniacs. In God's name, you people are the real thing. We are the illusion. The last thing the men behind the curtain want is a conscious, informed public capable of critical thinking, which is why a continually fraudulent zeitgeist is output via religion, the mass media, and the educational system. They seek to keep you in a distracted, naive bubble, and they are doing a damn good job of it. In 2005, an arrangement between Canada, Mexico, and the United States was made. This arrangement, unannounced to the public, unregulated by Congress, merges the United States, Mexico, and Canada into one entity, erasing all borders. It's called the North American Union, and you might want to ask yourself why you've never heard of this. In fact, there is only one mainstream reporter who has actually heard of and has had the courage to cover this issue. The Bush administration's open borders policy and its uh, decision to ignore the enforcement of this country's immigration laws is part of a broader agenda. President Bush signed a formal agreement that will end the United States as we know it, and he took the step without approval from either the U.S. Congress or the people of the United States. It's a deal that few have even heard of. It's being done again by very few people at the very top on behalf of the investment class, but the working class of people, uh, political officials across our country from communities, uh, from cities and so forth, they don't know anything about this. This isn't some trade agreement. It is a total removal of sovereignty from these countries, which will also result in a completely new currency called the Amero. Fall. Um, apart from that, I think one thing people who are dollar-based need to focus on is the Amero. That's the one thing that nobody's talking about that I think is going to have a big impact on, uh, on everybody's life in Canada, the U.S., and uh, Mexico. The Amero is the proposed new currency for the North American community, which is being uh, developed right now between Canada, the U.S., and Mexico to make a borderless community much like the EU, and uh, the dollar, Canadian dollar, U.S. dollar, and the Mexican peso replaced by the by default of this agreement, the American Constitution will eventually be obsolete. You would think that a situation like this would be on the cover of every major newspaper. That is until you realize that the people who are behind this movement are the same people behind the mainstream media, and you are not told what you're not supposed to know. The North American Union is the same concept as the European Union, the African Union, and the soon-to-be Asian Union, and the same people are behind all of them. And, when the time is right, the North American Union, the European Union, the African Union, and the Asian Union will be merged together, forming the final stages of a plan these men have been working on for over 60 years. A one world government.
one bank, one army, one center of power. And if we have learned anything from history, it is that power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. This is Aaron Russo, a filmmaker and former politician. To his left is Nicholas Rockefeller of the infamous Rockefeller banking and business dynasty. After maintaining a close friendship with Nicholas Rockefeller, Aaron eventually ended the relationship, appalled by what he had learned about the Rockefellers and their ambitions. Uh, I got a call one day from um, an attorney woman I knew, and she said, would you like to meet one of the Rockefellers? I said, sure, I'd love to. And uh, we became friends, and um, he began to divulge a lot of things to me. So he said to me one night, he said that uh, there's going to be an event there, and and out of that event, you're going to see we're going to go into Afghanistan. So we run pipelines from the Caspian Sea. We're going to go into Iraq to take the oil and establish a base in the Middle East. And we're going to go into Venezuela and, and try and get, and get rid of Chavez. And uh, the first two they've accomplished, Chavez they didn't accomplish. And uh, I said, you're going to see guys going into caves looking for, <laughs> looking for people uh, that they're never going to find. You know, he was laughing about the fact that you have this war. On terror, there's no real enemy. He's talking about how by having this war on terror, you can never win it because this is, this is an eternal war. And so you can always keep taking people's liberties away. And I said, how are you going to convince people that this war is real? He said, but the media. The media can convince everybody it's real. I mean, you know, it's just that you keep talking about things. You keep saying it over and over and over again. And eventually people believe it. You know, you created the Federal Reserve in 1913 through lies. You create 9-11, which is another lie. Through 9-11, you, then you're fighting a war on terror. And now all of a sudden you go into Iraq, which was another lie. And now they're going to do Iran. You know, and it's all one thing leading to another, leading to another, leading to another. Now I would say, to them, Why, what are you doing this for? What, what, what's the point of this thing? You have all the money in the world you ever want. You have all the power. I said, you know, you're hurting people. It's, it's not a good thing. And he would say, what do you care about the people for? Take care of yourself and you take care of your family. And then I said to him, What's the ultimate, what are the ultimate goals here? He said, the ultimate, the, goal, the ultimate goal is to get everybody in this world chipped with the, with the RFID chip and uh, have all money be on those chips and everything on those chips. And if anybody wants to protest what we do or violate what we want, we just turn off that chip. That's right, microchipped. In 2005, Congress, under the pretense of immigration control and the so-called War on Terrorism, passed the Real ID Act, under which it is projected by May 2008, you will be required to carry around a federal identification card, which includes on it a scannable barcode with your personal information. However, this barcode is only an intermediary step before the card is equipped with a VeriChip RFID tracking module which will use radio frequencies to track your every move on the planet. If this sounds foreign to you, please note that the RFID tracking chip is already in all new American passports. And the final step is the implanted chip, which many people have already been manipulated into accepting under different pretenses. We have a Florida family who are really pioneers in a brave new world. They have volunteered to be the first ever to have microchip identification devices implanted into their body. After 9-11, I was really concerned um, with the security of my family. I wouldn't mind having something planted permanently in my arm that would identify me. In the end, everybody will be locked into a monitored control grid where every single action you perform is documented. And if you get out of line, they can just turn off your chip, for at that point in time, every single aspect of society will revolve around interactions with the chips. This is the picture that is painted for the future if you open your eyes to see it. A centralized one world economy where everyone's moves and everyone's transactions are tracked and monitored, all rights removed. The most incredible aspect of all. These totalitarian elements will not be forced upon the people. The people will demand them. For the social manipulation of society through the generation of fear and division has completely detached humans from their sense of power and reality. A process which has been going on for centuries if not millennia. Religion, patriotism, race, wealth, class, and every other form of arbitrary separatist identification and thus conceit has served to create a controlled population utterly malleable in the hands of the few. 
Divide and conquer is the motto. And as long as people continue to see themselves as separate from everything else, they lend themselves to being completely enslaved. The men behind the curtain know this, and they also know that if people ever realize the truth of their relationship to nature, and the truth of their personal power, the entire manufactured zeitgeist they prey upon will collapse like a house of cards. The whole system that we live in drills into us that we're powerless, that we're weak, that our society is evil, that it's private, etc. and so forth. It's all a big fat lie. We are powerful, beautiful, extraordinary. There is no reason why we cannot understand who we truly are, where we are going. There is no reason why the average individual cannot be fully empowered. We are incredibly powerful beings. Now, I think I spent 30 years of my life, in the first 30, trying to become something. I wanted to become good at things. I wanted to become good at tennis. I wanted to become good at school and grades and, and everything I kind of viewed in that perspective. I'm not okay the way I am, but if I got good at things, I realized that I had the game wrong. That the game was to find out what I already was. Find out what I already was. individual differences to stand out. So you look at each person, the immediate hit is brighter, dumber, older, younger, richer, poorer, and we make all these dimensional dis distinctions, put them in categories and treat them that way. And we get so that we only see others as separate from ourselves in the ways in which they're separate. And one of the dramatic characteristics of experience is being with another person and suddenly seeing the ways in which they are like you, not different from you and experiencing the fact that, that which is essence in you and which is essence in me is indeed one. The understanding that there is no other. It is all one. And I wasn't born Richard Albert, I was just born as a human being. And then I learned this whole business of who I am and whether I'm good or bad or achieving or not, all that's learned along the way. sexual and religious chauvinism to rabid nationalist fervor are beginning not to work. A new consciousness is developing which sees the earth as a single organism and recognizes that an organism at war with itself is doomed. shows with this. Life's like a ride in an amusement park. And when you go on it, you think it's real, because that's how powerful our minds are. And the ride goes up and down and round and round. It has thrills and chills, and it's very brightly colored. And it's very loud, and it's fun for a while. Some have been on the ride for a long time, and they begin to question, is this real, or is this just a ride? And other people have remembered, and they come back to us, and they say, Hey, don't worry, don't be afraid ever, because this is just a ride. And we kill those people. Shut him up, I've got a lot invested in this ride. Shut him up! Look at my furrows of worry. Look at my big bank account and my family. This has to be real. It's just a ride. 
But we're going to kill those good guys and try and tell us that. You ever notice that? And let the demons run amok? But it doesn't matter, because it's just a ride, and we can change it anytime we want. It's only a choice. No effort, no work, no job, no savings with money. Just a choice right now between fear and love.